Welcome everyone to episode, uh, well, it's episode 63, but it's, it's what we're referring to as an in-between episode because we're sort of only on once a month and we're on last week and we're not due to be on next week, but we just, um, we just felt that squeezing a little extra one in while, on this topic while it was pretty hot and while we had someone of Alex's caliber, which we'll get to in a second, who agreed to do it, we were like, we, we, can't, we can't say no to this. So we're going to talk about the Nike uh, Vaporfly slash Next Percent slash Alphafly which I'm probably just going to keep saying Vaporfly, Vaporfly, just to, to make it easier. Um, and we've got Alex, and for those of you who don't know Alex, and I, I, um, I'm a massive fan of his work, uh, like I know a lot of people are, but I, I, went, I did a bit of Googling on you, Alex, because I'll be honest, I wasn't entirely sure about your, your backstory, and, and I didn't realise just how impressive it was. We're talking a, phys- a physicist with a PhD from Cambridge, middle and long distance runner for the Canadian national team, author, I know Craig's got your book, uh, journalist, one of most people's favourite runners, world uh, columnists, I think of all time. Currently, the sweat science column for Outside. I've probably I've probably left off loads, but we just can't be more delighted to have you. And we just thank you so much for your for your time and also your insight in what is um, inevitably going to be a, a pretty exciting topic to talk about. So thanks for joining us. Well, thank, thanks very much, Ian, and thank you, Craig, for, for that uh, gratuitous book plug on the screen share. I appreciate that, too. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I actually have your book on, on audio, Audible, but uh, I'm, a bit beh- I'm a bit behind in, in listening to audio books because I haven't been able to run much lately because of an injury, but it's, it's next. I'm, I'm getting to it next. I'm just listening to the Homo sapiens book at the moment, then you're next. <laughs> oh, Homo sapiens is great, but let me apologize in advance for the audio copy. Apparently, the, the guy who read it... Totally mispronounces Kipchoge uh, in different ways every time throughout the book. So Kipchuge and Kipch- Kipchoga, and it's so it's really annoyed a lot of runners. So I apologize in advance if it makes your head blow up. This is how famous you are. You you you're just you're too famous to even read your own audio book. You got someone you pay someone else to do it for you. I, I can't I can't I can't bear to reread <laughs> what I've written most of the time. Um, so let's let's uh, let's start from the basics. You know, we're, we're we're talking about the Vaporfly or the Vaporfly family, let's call them. And you you would probably have have had to have been living under a rock to not know what just sort of what a noise this is making in the running shoe world. And and you know, we've heard noise multiple times over the years about promises about performance. But for the first time, we're all sort of sitting up and listening, both as researchers, scientists, clinicians, and, and runners themselves, and going, "Hang on a minute, this." This could just be a bit more than noise here. We know that the five fastest men's marathons of all time have all been set this year in the Vapor Flyer. We know that the women's world record has just been uh, just been broken by Bridget Cosguy in the Vapor Flyer. We've got the Ineos 159 um, with uh, Kipchoge, Kipchoge uh, you know, in the Alpha Flyer. Um, so could we just, before we get to all of the data, all of the anecdote, all of the you know controversy, which inevitably will come as we talk, could we go back to basics just in case there's someone watching who says, kind of, kind of missed all this, haven't been reading about this. What is the Vaporfly? What is this thing that Nike brought out? And why should we be listening? What, what's different about it to other shoes? Yeah, so th- there's basically three things that make the Vaporfly radically different, or at least different from, from other racing shoes. Uh, the first and the most obvious one is it has a carbon fiber plate, a full length carbon curved carbon fiber plate in the midsole. The second is the midsole is made out of uh, a new foam that is uh, made out of a material called PBAX. Uh, Nike calls it the Zoom X foam, but this new foam is lighter and more resilient than any other foam that has been used in previous shoes, which means resilient. You squeeze it, it springs back with uh, and returns energy to you with greater efficiency than any other any previous shoe. Not radically different. Every every midsole is like that, but this is a little bit better than any previous midsole foam. And the third is that it has a big stack height, uh, and that's a, a sort of consequence of the previous two. That it has a very thick sole, whereas until a couple two years ago when the shoe appeared, everyone assumed that the fastest marathon shoes were the thinnest and lightest because extra weight weighs you down. But this foam is so light that you can get away with a thick cushiony sole uh, without paying too much of a penalty in weight. So you've got the plate, the foam, and the thickness, or the three ingredients. And just to get out ahead of, not to jump ahead in the conversation, all three of those things have been implemented in multiple running shoes by other companies for uh, well over a decade, probably two decades. None of them is new. Even the carbon fiber plate, uh, Adidas had 
an essentially identical carbon fiber plate in the early 2000s, which was used to set a, a marathon world record by Haley Gaber Selassie in 2007. But none of them really got above the noise or exceeded our skepticism, as, as you, were, you were sort of alluding to earlier, that we hear these claims from shoe companies all the time. It's great, it's great, it's great. Uh, but when somehow Nike managed to combine these three elements in a way that is demonstrably better. And the first version of their shoe, they called the Vaporfly 4% because there was lab data showing it was, you'd be 4% more efficient in that shoe. And so that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. And I remember when this first came out and like you say, because we're conditioned to be uh, critical of any, any marketing uh, because it just doesn't always marry the science. Well, when the 4% came out, we were all like, this, this is, this is a, a random number they've grabbed from nowhere. And, and there was immediate incorrect sort of interpretations that you were made 4% faster, which will we'll come to that being a slight misnomer uh, in a second. Um, but I remember before, getting stuck into the data, the anecdote I was hearing from runners in clinic that were using this shoe was like nothing I've ever heard from any other shoe. A friend of mine, a friend, very good friend of mine who I've known for 30 years, who runs a 2.30 marathon. Um, he's running almost every shoe, apart from a small period of time where he was sponsored by one brand. He's, he's tried the lot. And his exact words to me, I'll never forget them, were, this is like nothing I've ever tried before. You know, and, and he tried everything. So the anecdotes were building. And then the data came out. And it was clear that the 4% wasn't just a number they'd made up. Uh, we know that Roger, you know, the, the work out of the lab from Roger Cram and, and Wutger, Hoot Gamma, um, was... Uh, was 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 independent um and we should probably mention that shouldn't we we've got multiple studies that seem to be fairly robust and they're not all sponsored by nike is that is that that to my understanding that's a reasonable comment yeah i'd clarify that uh roger cram's study was funded by nike and yeah. cram is a consultant for nike so when he describes it he says it's not an independent study it's an external study so he did it on his own and he, he stakes his reputation on it uh, but it wasn't, it, you know, Nike, Nike was involved in the planning of that study. There have been studies since, I think it was, uh, I may be getting this wrong, I think it's Kyle Barnes from the University of, uh, from Eastern Michigan, maybe, who did a fully independent study that basically corroborated those results. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think there's, there's much doubt when you add, you know, all the various bits of data together. But yeah, the, the initial data was a Nike-funded study, but from an external group at, at the University of Colorado. Yeah, perfect. And let's just unpick. I was going to say, I know Roger is very, very adamant and, and quite angry at accusations that they were, they were somehow biased because Nike funded it. And I know, I know I blogged about that at the time, but you know, like he, he's, you know, he's staking his reputation on that study. Um, he's quite yeah. And, and if, if, if you know, Roger, he's, he's a, he's a, a, a details oriented person. Yeah. He, you know, he cares about the, the integrity of his research and the, and getting the details right. And so, you know, that, you know, that's neither here nor there, but I would say, yeah. uh, uh, having had a chance to speak to him I, 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 on numerous occasions, I'm pretty mm -hmm. confident that uh, that he, that he was, he did the study to the best of his ability. Yeah. And then you look at the other data points, and they line up with his data point, and you can yeah. say, yeah, that was a real study. Now, you know, again, it was Nike funded, so you never know. But but, yeah, uh, but I it, think it, it, it was kind of interesting tracking in social media the responses to the study. <laughs> yeah, you know, like very. Oh, it's a flawed study. Oh, uh, yeah, but what's wrong with it? Oh, it's just flawed. Yeah, but it's, it's um, and but also at the same time, and going back to what Ian was saying, yes, the anecdotes were starting to build up, but so were the people uh, claiming it's nothing more than a placebo. Um, and and there's still that dichotomy. Yeah. So there's still people who are like, it it doesn't work. It's all a lie. It's all advertising, and it should be banned. Well, a, yeah. <laughs> you, you can't have yeah. both. <laughs> yeah, but interesting. The the placebo claims are coming from those who've never tried it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, um, can we just talk about what what four percent means then? Because people incorrectly are thinking, oh, it's going to make me. They look at their PB, they think I, I, I'm going to be four percent faster. It's not not quite the way it works. Can you just unpick for people what the four percent really means? Yeah, and, and you know, just to give some backstory here, that that the answer to that question is is not at all trivial, and and I think it's fair to say nobody really knew the answer to that question when the shoe came out. And in fact, part of the research that Roger Cram's group did at the University of Colorado while they were still in stealth mode before the shoe came out was to try and answer that question. They said, well, what does it mean? I don't know. And they did this really elegant study where they had people running in shoes uh, that were identical, but they secretly hid varying numbers of, of lead pellets in the shoe uh, and then tested their running economy to try and estimate, to, to, in other words, to change you, you, the, the rule of thumb is, you know, you add a hundred grams to someone's shoe, you change their running economy by 1%. So they, 
added a hundred grams or, you know, various, various amounts of imperceptible weight to people's shoes without them realizing it and had them run 3000 meter time trials because they wanted to know, okay, if we change someone's running economy by 1%, how much difference does it make? And they found a pretty close to in that study, which is, you know, imperfect. And, you know, it, there weren't a million people in the study or anything. They found close to a one-to-one -one relationship. It was sort of like 1% in running economy gives 0.8% in improvement in, in race performance. So they started with that ballpark estimate that it was going to be somewhat close to one-to-one. -to -one. But then of course, if you do, if you take 4% and subtract it from a world-class marathon time immediately, you're like, well, why aren't these guys running 158? What's going on? So they started to think a little more carefully about that. And they did some modeling, looking at the effects of things like air resistance, which is non-linear. So you, 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 uh, change your running economy, you're able to go faster, but as you try to accelerate, it, it gets progressively harder in a, in a more than linear way. So, so what it ends up is even in the best possible case, it, uh, if everything is perfect, you get less, less than a one-to-one -one relationship. So 4% gives you less than 4% back. And if you're, the faster you go, the less you get back because the, the more air resistance matters. So if you're a two hour marathon, maybe you're expecting, I can't remember the exact numbers, but sometime, somewhere in the ballpark of two and a half percent faster. And if you're a four hour marathoner, you're, you're much closer to 4%. So that's the, the best possible case. And then you have to add in the way races are actually run, which is that you don't run exactly at your threshold the whole way. And so if you improve your economy, you're able to run exactly 3% faster. You're subject to other conditions. And so what it may mean is that if you're a little bit more efficient, you run at most, pretty much the same pace for most of the race and find you have a little more energy left at the end and are able to speed up by 1% or something overall. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, the real, there's the modeling, which says you don't get quite 4%. And then there's the, the real world way races are run, which reduces that a little more. And maybe you're looking at 1% to 3% or something like that. Reassuring though for those uh, those slower runners, I'm very much included myself under that umbrella. By the way, that that actually, if you're more of a five or a six hour marathon, and maybe maybe we're, maybe we're looking at, at higher percentages, right? Is that the way this works? That you get a higher percentage of what's available. Yeah, I mean, there's, <laughs> and there's other factors, and and I, I, we were chatting about this before going online. Like, what about uh, you, you know? There are other different. There are differences between a two hour marathon and a six hour marathon, or you know, the the two hour marathon or may weigh you know, 50 pounds or whatever, like, and are the shoes designed for these uh, uh, sort of elite bodies? Uh, I don't know the answer to this, but from what I've heard from asking people like Roger Cram and, and Vater Hukamer, who've, who've done some of the testing, that's not my impression. They, they haven't seen any relationship between running speed and, uh, and the, the change in running economy. I, I, I definitely can't rule it out, but my, my impression is that the, the, the results suggest that um, there's no sort of cutoff where you must be this fast to benefit or this thin or whatever the case may be. Yeah. yeah. I've definitely just... read, I've definitely read people's beliefs that this shoe has been potentially tuned for the 55 to 70 kilo runner and tipping the scales closer to 80 to 85. I've often thought, Oh, that's no, no, no good for me. So this, this is reassuring to hear that that might not be the case. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't have the, the secret facts, but I, I, yeah. I don't think that's the case. And I also think Nike's smart enough not to make a mass market shoe that's tuned for people who weigh in the sort of top 1%. So they may have tuned, I think th they definitely tune the carbon fiber plate differently for their most elite athletes. So when I, when I was reporting on the Breaking 2 project, this attempt to break two, the two-hour marathon, I was there when they were testing different shoes with different carbon fiber plate thickness for Eliud Kipchoge and the other runners. They wanted to find the stiffness that optimized his, uh, his efficiency, but that's not the shoe they're selling to everyone else. And I would imagine that yeah. the shoe they're selling to everyone else is tuned to a somewhat more generic mm -hmm. uh, body type and, and stride. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I'm, a little, I'm a little disappointed to hear that because I, I always assumed that, that at my speed, I could, I could run a marathon 15 minutes faster <laughs> with that shoe. <laughs> um, yeah. But, but, but actually, while, while, you, while you, we were just talking about that, it just occurred to me, that could be the difference between someone qualifying for the Boston Marathon or not. You, you know, Absolutely. like if, yeah. if it can make 10 minutes difference, at, so I think, you know, at, at the three to four hour, you know, 10 minutes is qualifying or not, <laughs> you know, it's, um... I, I, I think there's no doubt. And I was, you know, before we went on the air, I was, I was telling an anecdote. I was chatting with a friend last night who, who recently ran a, a 75 minute half marathon at age 50. And 
he had been hoping to set a, a Canadian age group record, but was disappointed to discover that someone had smoked him in the same age group by a minute and a half. And so he was like, what's going on here? How did this happen? And he, he went and looked through uh, the race photos from the people who beat him. And, and I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it was something like 15 of the 16 were wearing vapor flies. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is, this is very much starting to affect age group times. And on a bigger level, I, you know, I can believe that, you know, again, we're, we're speculating here, but I can believe that it might start not just affecting who qualifies for Boston. It might start changing the qualifying times if everyone yeah, well, starts to get faster. Yeah. Actually, let me just share this photo we talked about earlier on. This was from the Melbourne Half Marathon a couple it, of weeks ago. Is this, is this, is this Thomas? Yeah, yeah, I love this photo. This is, this is Thomas here um, who, who went on to win it, and he is listening at the moment, um, or at least he was earlier on. But they're all in vapor flies. That's the lead group in, in the Melbourne Half Marathon. Um, two, podiatrist, two podiatrists in that two group. Two podiatrists right? in that group. One, one, one Thomas, they actually went on to win it. So, and there's Aiden there as well. So it's um, you know, quite neat to see, but it, that's not an unusual photo when you look down at the feet. <laughs> yeah, this, this front of the pack, um, this front of the pack Nike dominance. Let's talk about this uh, if we can a little bit, because we, we, we absolutely don't want to, we should probably state, we don't want to take anything away from the athletes. People that are running these kind of times people like thomas but, but even you know kipchoge i know that there's a few people that have been upset when he, he did the the 159 challenge with Ineos that that it, people were only, only talking about the shoe and clearly the pace he maintained and he's just a beautiful runner and he seems like a beautiful person as well I don't want to take anything away from the athlete but we're just trying to talk about the 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 game they're getting on how awesome they already are here. And um, we look at this front of the pack thing and they're, they're all wearing them. And you could argue, well, they're all good runners. So is it, is it, you know, it's an argument that is the shoe making them fast or is it just fast people wearing the shoe? But we see the elites doing it at the front of the pack. We see the sub, the sub elites doing it. Is the reason that we're not seeing people cross the line, uh, you know, the middle of the pack runners crossing the line in the same way. Is it because they're not willing to spend 250 pounds on a shoe because they, you know, it, it, is there a mentality thing here or is this just feeding into why people think it's a shoe made for the elite runners? Uh, what, are we, what are we looking at correlation causation here? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I would say that my belief that the shoe works is not rested. It does not rest on photos like the one Craig shared. It's an interesting photo because it tells us how the world is reacting to the shoes, but it doesn't convince me that the shoe is, is what's putting those people ahead. And, and realistically, the shoe is moving people within a very narrow range within, you know, in the Melbourne half marathon, I'm sure there's thousands of people and it's, it's giving you 10 spots or, or, or five spots, not a 500 spots. So the people who are interested in this are the people who are most serious about uh, shaving for whom a minute shaving a minute off their time is meaningful, uh, which tend to be the people who are most serious and, and, and fastest. The reason we believe it works is for me, number one is the lab research. And then number two is the sudden change in elite performances. Because when someone goes from 75 minutes to 74 minutes in the half marathon, or even from 80 minutes to 74 minutes in a half marathon, there can be a million reasons. Uh, they decided to get more serious. They decided to, you know, cut down to 10 beers a night or whatever. Like there can be, anything can, ha can, can, can be associated with a change there. When you go from... 203 to 201 there's no to my knowledge there's no like oh he started doing a sunday long run that made the difference now and he, they're already <laughs> doing everything they can think of and then when they get two minutes faster and when not just one guy not just elliot kipchoge i mean kipchoge is a head and shoulders above the pack he's the greatest runner on the planet right now but when there's guys whose names i can't even remember right now who are running 202 in second place then it tells you that something has happened and you piece that together with the shoes and say, I think it was probably the shoes that are, that are making the difference in this sort of trend of performances. And there's, a, there's other things going on too. There's a new sports drink that reputedly is more effective. There's changes in mentality, which I, you know, I've written about and I think are real, but let's, let's be honest. The 99% uh, explanation is the shoes. Yeah. Actually, can I just ask just a little bit off topic, just looking at the 159. Um, he looked really fresh at the finish line. Do you think he had a lot left in the tank? 
It sure looked like it. It looked, yeah. you know, <laughs> even with a couple K left, I was like, get those pacemakers out of the way. Come on. Yeah. He is looking like he just wants to push by them. He's drifting wide. And then yeah. the moment when he finally, when they finally obviously got the signal, he like reaches through and it's like the parting of the Red Sea. Yeah, well, that, like, yeah. <laughs> get out of my way. Yeah. Sprints off. So it looked yeah. to me like he had, you know, it's impossible to know, but yeah. when, when you can, when you can ratchet it down by from a 250 per K to a 240 per K, yeah. it suggests that you know, you might have been able to average 249 or 248 yeah, or something. No. But I wonder, could have he been deliberately holding back? <coughs> I would say, so I, I have heard the rumors that it's like, these shoes will allow him to run 130 for the half marathon, but they know that, you know, the deep state knows that would be not, you know, not acceptable. So <laughs> yeah. we're going to, we're going to hold back. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't buy that. I, th I think they were being safe. They, he, they, yeah. they wanted to make sure they ran 159. Yeah. And so even if they thought he could run 158, it's still, you know, he's right on the edges of what he's capable of. And we all know, it's yeah. like when I think of my own running, I know what my best times are. And I, and I, so I know my body was capable of running, let's say I, for 5k, I ran 1352. I know I can run 1352 because I ran 1352. I tried to run faster than that many, 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 many times. And I didn't. And so to deliver on the day to say, if you'd said, Hey, Alex, we need you next April 30, 13th to run 1352. Even when I was at my peak, I would have said, well, that's a big ask. I've only done that once in my life. So what he was capable of versus what he was going to deliver on the day in a situation where failure was not an option like this was not a race where yeah. okay kipchoge had a bad day but but bob came second or you know took over and had a good day there's nobody else in the race if he if he runs anything other than sub two they've wasted 15 million pounds so i think they <laughs> I, I think that's the explanation for why he had something left is that he was they were being cautious and yeah mm -hmm. if on, on a different day if they sort of unleashed him with 5k to go maybe there would have been something more there on that note do you think they'll do you think they'll ever go again do you think they'll ever see, well, sub two was the real, you know, the historical barrier, wasn't it? Even though we know it's not ratified and it's not legit as far as world records are concerned, it's been done now and, it, and that's great. Yeah. Does the question now become, okay, what can we get out of this guy or, or, or any guy for that matter? Do you think they go again? Do you think, or do you think there's no buzz about it that no one's going to put that much money forwards anymore? I think not. But then again, I thought that after breaking two, I was surprised that someone was like, yeah, we're going to re-up, spend a bunch of money and try and take 25 seconds off. Because to me, breaking two, two years ago answered the question. Mm. He runs two flat 25. Nobody, nobody is going to stand up and say, it's impossible for humans to, to shave mm. off another 25 seconds. We all know it's possible. And so it's cool to do it. But I was surprised that, that someone was willing to spend that much money on it. Uh, and, and so I make the same prediction now. I don't think so. I could be wrong. Um, you, if there was going to be another one that didn't have a sort of ultimate round number barrier, I would think that a women's version of the event would be the logical way to go uh, mm. in terms of both, you know, from a marketing perspective and from a doing something new perspective. But I, I don't know. I mean, Kipchoge, I don't know how long he can keep going. It's, he's kept going much longer than I expect, but given that he's got a finite number of marathons in him, it's like it, maybe it would be a shame not to, to, uh, to squeeze as much as possible out of him. But to me, the number one priority, if he decides to do any more events would be, let's do a special event, but let's do it under IAAF rules so it can count mm -hmm. as a world record. Yeah. And th there are a lot yeah. of things that they did in Vienna that they can do it, under IAAF rules. The one thing they can't do is have pacemakers jumping in halfway. But if you get enough, you know, they had, they had 41 world-class runners there. If you, if you get those guys to run in a massive formation pacing for each other so that each pacemaker is kind of pacing the next round of pacers, maybe you can get some pacers to 30K or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then see what Kipchoge can do in a race that counts as a world record. Mm. Yeah. And, and the, the question, bringing it back to the shoes, which is on everyone's mind, particularly with the 159 is, you know, there was, it was so contrived and everything was perfect. And they, you know, they picked the, they picked the location. They, they, they had a window for the weather. You know, as you say, they had the 41 pacemakers that had that unique kind of drafting kind of formation with him in the middle, which was kind of cool to watch, I thought. Um, and the difference, the, the main difference that I could tell from the Monza breaking two was also that the crowd, and Monza was a very quiet, and, and, and I, I, I recall reading something from Kipchoge himself saying like that was the one thing he wanted if he was going to do this again was, was, was a big crowd. So there's, there's a few different things here, a different drafting approach, a different a crowd. Is it right to give all the credit to this, to, to the Alpha Fly, which was the shoe used? Or do you think it's a, a cumulative effect of everything? Um, I know we can never know for sure, but if, if, if we ask you to, you know, okay, okay, cards on the table, was it the shoe that got him there? What do you say? 
I think the shoe was necessary to, you couldn't have done it without the shoe. Uh, so after, after Monza, my, and it, like you said, we can't know the answers. After Monza, my estimate was, it, you know, if you put a gun to my head, what do you think made the difference between two or three world record and two flat 25 at Monza? I would have said about a minute from the shoes, about a minute from the drafting, about 30 seconds from all the other little things like handing water bottles on a bike and stuff like that. Since then, as you know, I, I sort of, especially given the changes in shoes, I sort of increased the estimate on the shoes. Uh, in, in Vienna, it was interesting to see him. He kept drifting off to the side out of the slipstream of the pacemaker in front of him. And I was like, that's strange. I mean, I guess it's sort of uncomfortable to run directly behind someone. But with that in mind, it made me think, maybe the drafting can't be that big a deal if he's able to slip out of there without uh, you mm -hmm. know, paying a price. So, th so I'd pay, maybe revise my estimate up. Maybe from the Mo for the Monza, maybe it's 90 seconds shoes. 30 to 45 seconds drafting and 15 to 30 seconds, everything else. The shoes in Vienna, I have no idea what's in them. There's rumors about three carbon fiber plates and you can see that there's these pods on them. I don't know what they do. I don't know what the evidence is. Um, but so maybe the shoes are even more at this point, but we don't know. And I'm a little cautious. We, we talked about this before. It's like for whatever, 30 years, we get used to shoe companies saying, you know, and now we have the amazing walking, talking miracle shoe that will change your life. And we know that that's not true and we ignore it. Now this time, Nike, you know, there really was a wolf there. It, they, they've been crying wolf, but this time there was a wolf. The shoe worked. <laughs> and I think there's a danger then of uh, concluding then that now we should believe everything they say. So now they say, look, we, instead of one carbon fiber plate, we have three carbon fiber plates and we have these pods and the pods have these things in them. Um, is that real? Does that do anything? I have no idea. And so I think now we're sort of almost flipping in the opposite direction. It's like Nike added pods. That means they must be getting 15%. So let's, I think we have to wait and see what they say about those shoes before we conclude that they're way, way better. But yeah. the, rumor, the rumors are that they are way, way better. That the, the number that I've heard, seen bandied around is 7 to 8%. And you think the Alpha Fly will become commercially available the same way that the Vaporfly and the Next Percent have um, in its current format, do you think? I hope not. I, I, I think I, I finally reached a kind of like seeing the, seeing the Alpha Fly, I was like, are you kidding me? This is getting crazy. And so <laughs> if it was up to me, if I was the you know, king of the IAAF, I would say uh, I would agree with a proposal that was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine yeah. a week or two ago from, uh, from Jeff Burns and, and Nick Tam saying, let's just put a limit on stack height. Uh, what, who knows what it is? Maybe it's 31 millimeters, maybe, which is what the original uh, vapor fly was supposed to be. Um, the, current, the current next percents are rumored to be 36 to 38 millimeters. There's rumors that the, the alpha fly is closer to 40. I don't know if this is all third hand or whatever. Um, and I don't think stack height is a perfect solution. And it, you know, maybe Hoka would be pretty upset if, uh, if there was a limit on stack height for competition shoes. So I, I don't know, but it just, to me, it's like, I, it's not so much that there's anything inherently wrong with the Alpha Fly. It's just that, do we have to have a shoe that changes the competitive landscape every year for three straight years? Uh, there's, mm. And there on the screen is, is this proposal about the regulation. So I think, I think that's a good one just to try and bring some, some stability back to the competitive landscape. But yeah, so I don't know. It, it may be that the Alpha Fly is, is just a concept car and it's so crazy that they're never going to bring it to the market. But Craig, Craig, you successful... must... Go ahead, yeah. Craig, you... Greg must like the idea of you must like the idea of a big stack car because you'll be six foot in the Alpha Fly, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but, but technically in, in the you know, exact interpretation of the IAAF laws, if they are going to use the Alpha Fly in a race, it has to be commercially available for other competitors. So that's a, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. I, I will say, first of all, okay, so the Vignano wasn't a race, so that's why they can get away yeah. with it there. But that rule, which was only introduced last year, mm -hmm. has been completely ignored by oh, everyone. Yeah. Well, like, and, and one of the things I found amusing is, and you know, I, I actually just had a, a I was on a, doing an interview with Ryan Hall, who the, the American marathoner, who. Uh, made an Instagram post recently just being very critical of the of the mm. Alpha Flies and people pointed out it's like Sarah Hall his wife ran 222 yeah, in I Berlin <laughs> in a prototype of yeah. the uh, uh, th that's not available to the general public now yeah. do I think that's unfair no I mean it's just it's just a shoe but it's like 
we have this shoe saying you have, or this rule saying that, that shoes have to be generally available. Uh, I have seen zero evidence that anybody is paying attention to that or there has been any enforcement of that. So, and that's a problem, uh, not because I think prototypes are necessarily evil, but because if you're going to have rules and you want people to obey them, you have to, you have to put some teeth into them. So I think that rule was a, a sort of a, an attempt to look like they were doing something about the vapor flies, but it seems to be just a uh, kind of window dressing. You'll hear here it is here. Such shoes, however, must not be constructed given the athletes any unfair assistance. Any type of shoe must be reasonably available to all in the spirit of universality of athletics. But that's, you know, it's, it's those, that, uh, oops, I can't highlight it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's those two sentences there which, as you're saying, are potentially being quite largely ignored. Yeah, let's well, say the second sentence is being ignored. The first sentence mm. is meaningless yeah. because it says like, you can't have like, an yeah. unfair assistance. Well, mm. What's unfair assistance? Uh, yeah. I mean, unfair assistance is something that breaks the rules. Well, what are the rules? The rules are you can't have unfair assistance. Mm. That tells you nothing about what you're allowed to do. <laughs> yeah. So just, just, just on the rules, let me just share this another slide. This is the... I put this to this, this is from a lecture I gave a year or two ago, and this was the timeline that Nike got the, the patent for the, the Vaporfly to October 2016. They made it clear they were working on a shoe December 2016, but the committee met to amend the rules in full knowledge of the existence of that shoe, and they didn't do anything then to ban it. Um, so I just find it quite curious that they had an opportunity to perhaps address that issue back then. And for whatever reason, I have my suspicions that, that it would be too hard to draw a line in the sand. But um, if you look at some of the latest media reports over the last week or two, they're looking at it again now. Um, and I would say, I agree that it's, you know, who knows what machinations were, were in play mm. uh, when this, you know, supposed committee was, was meeting. Mm. Um, one factor that's worth considering is that Nike, I think in some ways the worst thing they did, but maybe the smartest thing they did was to have, um, uh, you know, certain athletes wearing prototypes of these shoes, chosen athletes wearing prototypes of these shoes throughout 2016. And so the top three men's marathoners at the 2016 Olympics and the, the winner of the women's marathon at the 2016 Olympics, they were all wearing Vaporfly prototypes disguised as, as Zoom Streak 6s. And so by the time, and nobody knew this, so by the time the IAAF Rules Committee is meeting, they're facing the choice of, of basically saying that the Olympics were won the previous year in an illegal shoe. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, you know, they kind of had the knife to their back uh, in, in that sense. It, it was, there was no good solution. And, and I, you know, I honestly, it, truth be told, I blame Nike for that. I don't think that was fair the way they, they introduced those shoes. I don't think it was fair to other athletes. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, what's done is done and it's not, there isn't an obvious rule that they violated. There's maybe a sense of fairness that they violated. And then I think the IAAF was put in an awkward position. I think they sort of hoped ah, this problem will go away because everyone will have access to these shoes. But then Nike introduced a better shoe the next year. And then now this is what sort of pushed me kind of a little bit over the edge with, with Vienna. It's like, oh, there's even another shoe. And it's not even just like they changed the color line, the colorway or whatever. It's, it's got like these, you know, moon rocker pods on it. It's, like, it's just like the, the fact that the envelope keeps getting pushed is now, I think it's now is another opportunity for Nike to, or for the IAAF to step in and say, okay, now we've had enough. Now we're going to implement a rule. Will they? Uh, the rumors are no, and, and, you know, no would not be surprising, but I really hope that they surprise us and do something just to at least kind of set some parameters of what's allowed and make it clear A is allowed and B is not. So if it's B, don't do it. And if it's A, don't complain about it. Uh, where, where do we land on the debate between these shoes, I've seen these shoes being referred to as performance enhancing, uh, you know, drugs, shoe doping, I think is the, 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 the cute phrase that's being used. And then on the other flip side, there is not a single sport that, and sports company that isn't trying to completely evolve uh, with regards to their natural innovation and evolution of the sport. So, you know, on the one hand, we don't have tennis players playing with wooden rackets anymore. On the other, we know that there's swimsuits that have been banned. It just feels like really grey and murky waters. And um, at what point do we say, well, shoes have always tried to evolve and be in innovative, and Nike are known for being, you know, one of the one of the more innovative of companies. 
from your comments, are you, uh, have you reached a position, Alex, where you think, okay, innovation and evolution is good, but I feel like we've, that you feel like they've crossed the line here into, into something that it doesn't feel like it's, it's just trying to advance and it feels more like shoe doping. Yeah, it's a, that's a complicated question. Hopefully you have time for a 45 minute answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's so the, the two sports I often compare, I, or I think of it are in relation to the, Speed skating, which had the clap skate in the late 90s, which it, I improved everyone's performance by a couple of percent. And speed skating, you know, went through a tough time because the Olympics, I think it was the Dutch who swept the Olympics in about 98 because they were the ones who had the clap skate. Then everyone else got it and things settled back into normal. Now nobody thinks twice about it. If you're a competitive speed skater, you have a clap skate. Uh, versus swimming, where they had this sort of similar beginning of like world records getting wiped out because of swimsuit advances and then again and then again and then they stepped in and said okay enough ban the swimsuits they or at least set some parameters there's still swimsuits are better now than they were 20 years ago set some parameters and we'll go and, and within that you're allowed to to work on it and they moved on and no one no one talks about it anymore and so what is what's the difference between those two situations to me the difference is that the clap skate was one thing people brought in the clap skate and then it settled into a new equilibrium uh, whereas the swimsuits, it was like every year they were coming out with a different, with a better swimsuit. And so it seemed like a constant arms race where if you didn't have the latest swimsuit, you were screwed. And I think initially the Vaporfly felt to me like the clap skate. It's like, wow, they came up with an idea. It's going to change everything. Then we're going to settle into the new normal. But instead it's starting to feel to me more like the swimsuits where it's like every year it's like another shoe. What does this one do? What, you know, so that that's, that's why I've sort of tipped towards the, regulation. But in terms of the, the broader question of what's the role of technology in sport, I mean, one thing that strikes me is that, as again, as we said before, for decades, every shoe company, you know, every, every year announces that they've got a shoe that's going to make you faster. And nobody, nobody blinks an eye. They, it, it's, it's fine. Nobody objects to this idea of shoes making you faster and, until it actually started working. So it's sort of strikes me as strange and especially then you think about well why is this one different it's like well they've got the carbon fiber plate that's the, you know, that's that's beyond the pale they've got this carbon fiber plate it's like there have been at least half a dozen shoe companies that had carbon fiber plates in their shoes long before the vapor fly fila had a the fila racer in the 1990s adidas basically developed the nike plate uh with research in the early 2000s they published it in 2006 showing the running economy advantage with a stiff carbon fiber plate, basically the same as the Nike one, very similar to the Nike one. Haley Gabriel Selassie set a world record in the marathon in a carbon fiber plate shoe in 2007. There were zero peeps about this is unfair, carbon fiber plates, blah, blah, blah. And the analog to the Zumax foam is, the, is Adidas's Boost foam, which again had peer-reviewed data showing that it improved running performance. It was good enough that four consecutive world records were set in Adidas Boost shoes between 2008 and 2014. Nobody was like, this boost foam is unacceptable. So it's, it's hard for me to, to get behind the sort of black and white claims that these are cheater fly shoes and, you know, nobody should accept carbon fiber plates. Everyone was fine with carbon fiber plates. Everyone was fine with trying to improve the foam. It's just that by some circumstance, skill or luck or, or combination of them, Nike put these ingredients together in a way that makes a noticeable difference, you know, within one generation. And that creates an unequal playing field and so it's not that I think carbon fiber plates are, are inherently evil or that uh, space age foams are inherently evil. It's that right now we have an unequal playing field. And so we need to take some steps mm. to, 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 to constrain that, maybe not to eliminate it. We don't have to say that everyone has to run in brand X, but we can say, let's put some limits so that the advantage isn't going to be seven to 8%, that, that maybe it's going to be, maybe Nike is going to get 4%, but the other shoe companies are going to have rival prototypes that get two or 3%. So the difference is going to be back down to one or 2%, which there's always been between shoes. Yeah. Cause it, you um, know, like I, I, I mean, I'm running in the, the Hocker carbon X with the carbon plate. I mean, if you're going to try and ban any particular shoe, there's going to have to be a line in the sand. The key yeah. thing is where's that line going to be? And who is who and how they're going to determine if a shoe has crossed that line or not, and then to complicate that, the response to shoes is always going to be subject specific. So that's my speculation as why they didn't address the issue back in 2017 because <laughs> they just you can't. Or but then again, the proposal read the stack height. That is one way that. But then innovation will occur within that stack height. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and so, you know, my, again, the, the, from the moment I heard about these shoes, my instinct was there needs to be some regulation, but I could never come up with what the right regulation is. You can't, you don't ban stiffening elements. What are you going to do? Ban pronation control? You don't yeah. ban carbon fiber plate because they'll just yeah. find some other lightweight material. You, you, you know, like you don't ban springs because then you're banning midsoles and nobody wants to ban midsoles, right? Like it's, it's, there's, there's, there's a lot of solutions that seem obvious until you actually look into what's going on with the yeah. shoes and how they work. Um, and so that's why the stack height is not perfect because it permits the vapor flies to exist. But when you also think about the real, the realistic implementation of this, you don't want to have to have an MRI at the start line of every race to, <laughs> to check for, you know, like stack height at least is easily measurable. Yeah. It's simple. It just puts an upper bound on it to, to yeah. kind of rein things in. It doesn't make things perfect. And we, yeah. The, the even playing field is a myth and is a sort of aspirational goal, not a, not a sort of, uh, yeah. you know, absolute that we're trying to strive for. Yeah. But then you get shoes like, you know, this one that I also run on, which is the Essex, the, the meta glide or the glide run now that is just, it is so stiff and it's got quite a rocker action in it and they're making claims, which I assume they can back up from their own lab about the, the economy of action to do, to do, to do with ankle power. Um, so, which is similar to the to the yeah. Nike shoe that they, yeah, they, so they believe it's, there's it no, has something to do with it. There's no carbon fiber plate in this shoe, <laughs> you know. Like it's yeah. just weird. It's just that that line in the sand. And then I don't know whether you ever remember these shoes. This is the Area One that's got that um, massive. It's got a. It's a. It's much thicker stack height under the lateral forefoot, huh. and it's got a massive toe spring. And they've got time trial data that I've seen that uh, people were running, I think it was five, five K, 7% faster than those shoes. Wow. Now I don't, I think they've gone out of business now, but I, I, um, nothing to do with stack, nothing to do with stack height, nothing to do with carbon fiber plates. Yeah. They were making claims of a 7% faster running in the, the shoe that it was thicker under the lateral forefoot. Now I can speculate as to why, but again, I keep coming back to where's this line in the sand. <laughs> when you've got yeah. shoes like that. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree. And I think that it's, that's why it's sort of, to me, it's sort of like, and you can make the analogy to doping again. People mm. are like, well, why is this, you know, why is pseudoephedrine restricted and why is caffeine allowed and why is this banned and why is that not banned? And I think it's, it's a, in a sense, it's a fool's errand to search for this sort of uh, bright line where we understand this is the boundary and this is what we, you know, it's obvious that everything to the left of this is, is not fair and everything to the right is. That's not how it works. It's always going to be a gray area. And the best thing we can do is draw a clear line, accepting that it's an arbitrary line, but draw a line that everyone agrees on. And then we're all on the same page. So now we know you're allowed to take baking soda before a race and you're allowed to take caffeine, but you're not allowed to take ephedrine or whatever. Or, or, or whatever the case may be, it doesn't, there's, it's not that one is inherently evil and one is inherently good. It's that let's just, let's just set some parameters. Yeah. One of the um, common things you'll often read from people that are shouting that this, this shoe's unfair and it needs banning is that it, uh, it, 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 it acts like a spring. And um, mm -hmm. I read a brilliant article recently, I'm sure you saw it as well by Brian Metzler. Um, and he basically said all, 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 all shoes act like springs. And I thought it was just, it just, a, it was just such a, a, an obvious comment to say that, that people, you know, the armchair, I think, Craig, you refer to them as armchair lawyers, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, who, who have suddenly decided they know, where, they know where this line is. But as you yeah. say, it's clearly not that simple. Could we talk about, um, Craig, well, before I get on to that, we're going to talk about the possible risks with this shoe, which we're, we're going to be completely theorizing, of course. But before we do, Craig, has anything come through while we've been talking? No, that we no, need no, to? no questions, just lots of comments. There, there was one, someone saying it, the carbon fiber plate had nothing to do with it. It was the compliance and resilience of the foam. Um, okay, well, let's, 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 quick, let's quickly unpick that while we've got mm. Alex's brain here. Because um, I've read this too, the debate of, is it, is it the carbon? You know, we know the shoe is, is um, improving people's efficiency. I don't think there's any debate about that. I don't think anyone disagrees yeah. with that now. And we've talked about what makes this shoe different. Um, and, the, you know, I've definitely read people saying, is it, is it the carbon or is it the foam? Um, like it's a dichotomous either or. I guess let's yeah. give a third option. Is it that beautiful, that beautiful cake mixture of the two in perfect harmony with each other? But, but what would your take be on that comment that it's not the carbon, it's all about the foam? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd, I'd come close to agreeing with it. I mean, I wouldn't make it quite so uh, bold. I'd say 
the, 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 the real answer is we don't know exactly how the shoe, shoe works. Nobody does. Lots of people claim they do. Generally, the less they know about the shoe, the, the more sure they are they know how it works. Um, <laughs> the, there's been, and, 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 you know, no credit to Nike here that they haven't. So there's been one good study that tried to figure out how the shoe works, um, but they weren't able to do the, the obvious experiment, which is let's try this shoe with the same geometry, but no carbon fiber plate in it or the same geometry with a carbon fiber plate, but with a different midsole foam. Because that would tell us, that would start to give us some real answers. We don't have those experiments, so we don't know. But Roger Cram's lab did their best to try to do a bunch of measures, trying to figure out, well, how much is the foam compressing? How much is the, is the, the, the shoe bending? Where does the energy come from? And, and like the commenter said, the, their conclusion was that the vast majority, by, you know, by an order of magnitude, of the energy savings is coming from the foam's resilience. Uh, so it's, it's the ability of this foam to, to be super light, but you, since, it, since it's super light, you can have a really thick layer, which is essentially the equivalent of having a bigger battery to store and return energy. And then it squishes down and, and when it springs back, it gives you almost all that energy back. Now, could you make that shoe without the carbon fiber plate or would it be like running on a giant marshmallow? Uh, would you just kind of fall over? I, I don't know because we haven't tested that, but I can speculate that A, the, the carbon fiber plate is helpful for, for stability, and B, the carbon fiber plate probably has some benefit of its own. What they think the benefit of the carbon fiber plate is, again, this is Nike-funded but external research, uh, but also agreeing with what the Adidas-funded researchers believed when they were testing basically the same carbon fiber plate, is that the, the benefit of the carbon fiber, and, and there's actually some independent researchers in Germany which also testing carbon fiber plates, and they all believe the benefit of the carbon fiber plate is that it basically uh, m m limits losses at your toe, big toe joint. That normally when your big toe bends, you lose energy as it bends and your, it, your, it straightens when you're in the air so you don't get any of that energy back. The carbon fiber plate keeps it a little straighter, limits those losses. The problem is that the, the cost of that stiffening is that it changes your ankle work and makes you less efficient. And so it's the curve of the Nike carbon fiber plate that allows you to get the stiffening of the, of the toe joint without paying the price at, in the ankle joint. Is that the story? I, you know, I, I don't know, but my understanding from the people, from the data I've seen, as opposed to the sort of, uh, you know, very self-assured assertions of people who, ha who have no data, is that the, the foam is a big part of it and the spring plays a role, but I mean the the plate plays a role, but not as a not as a spring per se. Uh, it, it's it's actually the foam that is the biggest spring in the system. Perfect. Anything else, Craig? Or can I? No, move just on to more, the... just more, just comments. No, no questions here. Um, that was the Perfect. main let's one. Let's get on to let's get on to the last bit before we wrap up. And it's it's the the, the nothing's perfect, right? Nothing comes without a cost in life. We know this. We we rob Peter, and at some point we probably have to pay Paul. So. Everything's too good at the moment. Everyone loves the shoe. I've not spoken to a single person that doesn't like this shoe. You know, they all say it feels great. It performs great. The times are reflective of that. At what point are we going to pay Paul? What, what might the risks of this shoe be? What might the costs be? We don't have any kind of longitudinal uh, understanding of this yet because it's all so new. But uh, surely with increase, you know, certainly when we look at most metrics, what, what significantly increases performance isn't necessarily going to reduce injury risk quite quite the opposite sometimes what's perfect for, for performance and perfect for injury risk uh, sort of mitigation are not always in line with each other so do you think there's going to be a long-term cost here do you think is your understanding that we may be uh, exposing people to certain injuries in the future or do we just not know enough yet i think one I mean, so the, you know, the obvious answer is I have no idea, but, but uh, <laughs> to, to, to try and be a little more informative than that, I think one, interest, one distinction to make is what are the effects of running in the vapor fly for a marathon versus what are the effects of running in a vapor fly every day? Now, maybe the saving grace of the vapor fly is that they're so unbelievably expensive and, and not especially durable that most people aren't doing their daily training in the vapor fly. And so what you're talking about is how are you going to stand up to running a marathon in the vapor flight? Now, the sort of anecdotal Nike line, which, which I've certainly heard from a lot of people unaffiliated with Nike, is that it's lovely to run on this big bed of cushioning and you get to the end of the marathon and it only feels like 50 men have been hammering your legs with hammers instead of a thousand <laughs> men. So, you know, you're tired, but you're not quite as tired. And that sounds pretty good to me, to be honest. Um, and, you know, of course, some people are thinking, well, you know, it's going to change your, 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 your biomechanics in a way that may hurt you. 
that may be true. Uh, it's almost certainly true. For, it will be true for some people. Any change, as far as I'm concerned, you make any change to anybody's biomechanics, and if you do it to 10,000 people, some of them are going to get hurt as a result of that change, right? Like it's just, it's, maybe that's too pessimistic, but um, I think things will be different if you start looking at people running in that, that kind of shoe every day with such a dramatic sort of angle on the shoe. I know if you, if you stand in them, you feel like you're kind of being pushed forward. So it makes me wonder which, which muscles are going to be underdeveloped, which muscles are going to be overstressed. Um, is, it, is it worse than conventional shoes or is it just different? Um, and that's, that's a question that I, I'm not, that's not a question where I'm trying to lean one way or the other. I don't know. Yeah. yeah just, just, my, just my anecdote on that is I've got a marathon next week and I haven't made a decision on the shoe I'm going to wear. The shoe I want to wear is going to overload a area that I have an injury in at the moment. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, yeah, you, you, it's Rob Peter to pay Paul. Um, the shoe I don't necessarily want to wear is probably going to be the best one for me to wear in that particular marathon, but it's, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Craig, genuine question. Why haven't you purchased a pair of Nike next percent to run this marathon? In? Um, for the same reason you haven't. Does it look you like you've made out of money? Just, just well, well, yeah. <laughs> we don't make enough money, and and two, I, I, every time I've tried, they've been sold out. I just you just got to be in the right so place at the right time. I have tried from so time like, to time, but yeah. yeah, like me, you've tried. But, yeah. So no, if, I, if anyone's from Nike's watching, if anyone, I'm a I'm a UK size nine. I don't know what size are you. Let me just check. It? I'm a. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a US 10 and a half. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so yeah, just send them on, send them on. Perfect. So is there anything else we need to cover Craig? Um, no, I think that's been good. I think we've covered everything. Um, I mean, we, it yeah, is a topic that's so, that's so interesting. And, and so and because we don't have lots of answers, I could, you could, you could easily sit here and talk about it for, for another hour. I, I know, but um, if there's no questions that have sort of come in off of Facebook, um, shall we wrap up? Yep. No, I, I think we've, we've, we've done well. Let's, so let, let, Let's just ask one final question. So Alex, IAAF meeting, are, are they going to ban this shoe? My, uh, my heart says yes, but my head says no. And uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll be surprised if they do, but I'm pleasantly surprised. And, and in ban is the strong it, to in, introduce some regulations that restrict things uh, yeah. I, I within, think, within, yeah. within competition yeah you know i i was talking to someone uh, just yesterday and they said it's nothing but good for nike because if they ban this shoe from if the iaaf say you cannot compete in this shoe in an affiliated race it's sort of admitting that this shoe is is shoe doping you know to give it its title oh, so yeah. every yeah. average every average runner like me who can i'm out i'm out, i'm out getting my hands on a pair and whatever nike charge for it i'm buying it because it's that good that it's been banned from competition and if they don't ban it they've probably got lots of athletes going well i'd, I'd quite like to be a nike athlete right now you know it, it's a really interesting time i don't think they can lose as a company can they? it's a win-win-win they i mean they've they've got a checkmate there's not the it's no matter what happens they have hugely altered the trajectory of people's perceptions of who makes the fastest shoes. And even if and when the Vaporfly either disappears or is matched by other companies, uh, the, the reputational gain they've made, other than from the people who hate them, which are, there's a sizable number of people, but <laughs> for, for, for the unaffiliated, uh, you know, yeah, they've, they, Adidas was ahead three years ago. Adidas yeah. seemed to be the company that was making the fast shoes if you wanted to be a serious racer. Now Nike has... Uh, you know, trump that ace, uh, you know, substantially. Yeah. Actually, just one more thing. I'll just share this photo that, that we're, I'm sure we've all seen doing the rounds <laughs> on social media. I had to look carefully to see what was wrong with this picture. Um, there's obviously some branding on it, covering up some other branding, which is, um, I think, is happening quite a bit. <laughs> um, with, I, and, I I, there's a, uh, I don't know if you know, in the UK, there's the, there's a group of, there's, there's the ASICS front runner, um, sort of phenomena where people are kind of affiliated with that. They're normally social media influencers. And there's, there's one particular one who's been photographed at several races wearing a version of the Vaporfly, despite being an ASICS front runner. So it's kind of interesting when you're affiliated, but you, you know, that, that this shoe is giving your competitors an advantage. I think that's a kind of interesting position to be in, isn't it? I, I know a few people who have lost sponsorships uh, mm. as a result of being spotted in, in the wrong shoe, a few yeah. sort of sub elite runners. 
but the, um, but it's... this happens in footy. It happens in so many other sports. It's sort of you know teams are sponsored by one company. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and cycling. Lucky, we're, yeah, yeah. lucky we're not good enough or fast enough to be sponsored by anyone, Craig. So we can wear yeah. what we want, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I think that's a good spot to finish up. So look, thanks so much, Alex. It's been a really good hour. Um, I'll just share this. So for those of you who want to connect with Alex, this is his website. I've put a link in the discussion. Um, as I said at the start, I have his the, the book Endure on my audio books. I just haven't got to it yet. Um, so um, thanks so much, Alex. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, guys. And really we'll, we'll reconvene in, uh, in one week when the shoe world has completely changed again at the way things are done. <laughs>